Amen. Thank you, J.D. and the team uh, for leading us in that powerful uh, time of worship. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, we'll be leading, uh, reading from Luke chapter 20, verse 45, all the way through to 21, verse 4. Uh, the astute among you will note that we are repeating some verses from last week. So I'll start off tonight by saying the numbers and chapters in your Bible, the verses and chapters in your Bible are not biblical. The verses and chapters in your Bible are extra-biblical. They were added by an editor. And unfortunately, uh, one commentator said, the verses and chapters seem to be like a man who was riding on a railway, and every time he hit a duck duck, he added a verse, and every time he hit a bridge, he adds a chapter, because sometimes they make no sense. Now, I say that because we get to a point where, unfortunately, even I fell into the, the trap of an artificial break to this, the, um, the, the, the story um, that is clear once you actually do a proper study of it. Uh, I don't regret it. I thought last week was necessary. We need to dive into the hypocrisy that we covered. But there is a contrast created in this passage that we're going to read tonight. And in fact, in Mark, we read that this passage is not divided by chapters and so it's easier to study. And what we will see when we study this together is that the demands that God places on us in this kingdom that He calls His are impossible. I'm going to put this out there. What we are doing in church, what we plan to do, what our vision is, you cannot do. Full stop. I know you wanted me to say you cannot do without God's help. I'm just going to put this out there. You cannot do. So you might be thinking, okay, encourage us, brother. Encourage us. I'm going to encourage you. Christianity is impossible. It puts demands on your life that are, humanly speaking, impossible. I'm going to unpack what this means tonight in our chapter. So let's read together. Luke chapter 20, verse 45 to 21, verse 4. This is the word of the Lord. And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples... Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, who love greeting in the marketplace and have the best seats in the synagogues and the place of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses for the pretense, uh, sorry, for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive great condemnation or they will receive severe punishment. Jesus looked up and saw a rich, the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put two uh, small copper coins in. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more in than all of them. For they all contribute out of their abundance. But she, in her poverty, put all she had her life. May the Lord bless the reading of his word tonight. Now, we need to bring back last week's reading to the fact that there is a natural contrast made in this passage that if we just separate it out and look at the widow's might, we are going to miss it. This passage is meant to be contrasted with the hypocrisy of the teachers of the religious law. And Jesus does this intentionally. He looks at this widow and makes a lesson of them because what Jesus wants to tackle in us is deeper than just giving. And I think if we grasp this, we, we might actually see how intense the demands God places on us. And then, hopefully, if I do my job right tonight, we will see what He gives us in order to do that demand. Now, to do this, let's look at this contrast, poverty and wealth. This is our first point this evening. There's an obvious, obvious contrast in this passage between the rich and the poor, right? The poor widow and the rich giving. And... Many times people read this in isolation, and so they make the lesson in isolation. And it's always a moralistic lesson, the importance of giving. And man, as pastors, we want to nail that down, you know? Give, you know, just, it, it's, it's great. It's whole, so wholesome. It really is just a nice lesson about giving, and it's good to give. It's better to give than to receive, you know? Give abundantly. It's great moral lessons. We know this. You know it's better to give than to receive. It's much more wonderful to give uh, your, out of your little than to give little out of your much. You know these great statements. However, the problem with these kinds of lessons is they're not true. 
And it's not what Jesus is saying. What do I mean here? Well, one thing that struck me when I was reading this passage, when I was doing the, the research for this text, was that this woman was just as devoured by her gift than what Jesus demanded the, hypocrisy, the hypocrites were doing to widows anyway. I mean, he says, you would devour widows' houses. And then he looks up and sees a woman give to the temple and is like, that's great. It seems like, almost in a sense, like Jesus is contradicting himself. Or at least being somewhat hypocritical when he states that when the teachers devour women and their properties, it's okay. I mean, it's not okay. But when the temple does, that's okay. The second issue that came up was that her, her gift actually made no dent on the temple treasury. Just think about this practically. Let's pick someone. Elon Musk, the world's richest man. If he came to our church, just loved the church, you guys just welcomed him. And he's like, okay, I'm going to tithe. And he doesn't even tithe. He just gives like a little pen, penance of his money. He gives 15 million rand to the church. That's less than less than 1% of his total wealth. It wouldn't even, he wouldn't even bother it. We would be blown away, right? We would be like, best gift ever. Let's go and do stuff. Now, we don't celebrate if you gave your entire salary. Because, let's be real, it's not as impactful. If you gave your entire salary, we'd probably say, yeah, there's been some great gifts. Praise the Lord. But it's not 15 million rand. In other words, little is little and much is much. It doesn't magically become more because you gave it with the right attitude. If you give a little, there's only a little that we can do. If you give much, there's much that we could do and what God could use that for. So that lesson doesn't work. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you don't have to give because you don't give a lot. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm trying to show you is that big gifts make big impacts because logically they're big. I mean, it's not rocket science. So, church, obviously Jesus cannot be giving us a lesson on the nature of gifts. That's not what the point of this passage is. So what is Jesus actually trying to show us? Well, I think it's rather simple. He's showing us that the nature of our giving is a metric of our soul. It's an outward sign of what is going on inside of us. And this repeats throughout the, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. That God celebrates outlandish giving for one reason. How we give is a metric for who we are. How we give is a metric for who we are. Where it actually matters. In our core of cores. This leads me to my second point. Giving and devouring. This is why we needed that second pass the earlier passage. If we look at this passage, we see a clear contrast between not simply the rich and the poor, but a contrast, contrast between giving and taking, giving and devouring. Now, let's ask a question. Why does Jesus make light of the widows right after he confronts the teachers of the law who devour widows' houses? This is not a mistake. And the fact that it's repeated in two Gospels means that Jesus wants us to get something. And what he is contrasting is not the quality of the gift, but who these people are by nature. Either this woman is by nature a giver. The leaders of the temple, or the teachers of the temple, were by nature devourers, takers. Essentially, there's two types of people in the world. There's those who give, those who are givers, and those who are takers. And takers pretend to give. They love making generous offers. They love making light of their generosity. But ultimately, their giving ends where? In themselves. That's why they make light of it. That's why they love the self-adulation. And that makes them, church, devourers. If you are giving to be recognized, you are by nature a taker. Because what you are doing is using that gift for your own reward. You are still consuming. We are flooded with this online, aren't we? 
How many videos have you been exposed to on your social media apps of people doing these outlandish acts of generosity, right? Like, look, you know, just walking up to random people on the, on the street and giving them a, a makeover. And how do they make you feel? Probably pretty rubbish because you're like, ah, oh, I should be doing more, right? But you need to ask yourself one question. What was the reason for this person putting it online? Because there is a process of them taking, and I mean, there's a whole logic to this, of them recording this whole process, which is not easy, editing it, making it look nice so that they can do what? Post it. What is the end goal of posting online? It's not just to put yourself out there. No one put stuff online and just be like, let it be, let it land where it lands. People put stuff online and what are they doing constantly? How many likes have I got? How many recognitions? How many retweets or whatever the, you know, the new things are with uh, Twitter and I'm showing my age. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Caleb, I'll one day catch up to you, man. <laughs> Church, we are flooded with a, a tsunami of devourers. People who are doing acts of good, who are giving for the sole reason of recognition. Of the reward of the act of kindness. And you know what that does? Just think about what this does to the person they are being kind to. It makes them... A commodity. It turns them from being a person who actually needs something to being an end for that other person's fame. They are devouring that person. They are using them. And that's why we look at this and part of us says, this is, I mean, we're like, we like the act. It, it speaks to our soul of generosity and kindness. But on some level it also grinds us. Alan Watts said, all the do-gooders in the world, whether they are doing it for themselves or doing it for others, are troublemakers. He continues and says, sometimes doing good for the others and even doing good for oneself is amazingly destructive because it's full of conceit. It's full of conceit. You're still devouring. I mean, let's ask a question tonight. Why are you so important? obsessed about self-improvement about getting better let's make a Christian tonight why are you so obsessed about growing in the Lord is it just for the sake and joy of knowing God more or is it a little bit self-focused because you want to you want to be the best guess what you're in danger of being a devourer and what concludes his thought by saying that we might have a plague in the 21st century of virtuous people, and that's not a good thing. And in fact, he was prophetic. We do. We have a plague of do-gooders, of virtuous people. And you know what's so crazy about the world we live in? Is we actually have an army of people preaching to everyone of how the world should be. And how everyone who's not them is what? Bigots, hateful, you know, whatever, add the phobia in. And all of us look at this and say, okay, they're trying to be virtuous, but the world that they say is virtuous is what? Insane. Because they are devourers. You know why they want the whole world to think and act and believe like them? To prove that they're good. They're devourers. They're eaters of people. They're takers. They desire to be seen. They want the rest of the world to recognize them as righteous. And church, unfortunately, we too have been victims of this mentality. The church has been filled with people who want to be good. And you know what that makes us? Takers. Devourers. Eaters of people. The only hope, church, of people actually being good is if their entirety of their being is good. If they are givers by nature. And this kind of giving is silent, invisible, forgotten, and powerful. And this leads us to our third point. 
giving what we cannot keep. Jesus highlights the gift of this widow not because of its outlandishness, not because of the size, but because of what she did in giving it. We miss this in the English because our English translations try and make the Greek understandable, which is great. That's a good thing. You don't want to read Greek because it's, you don't understand it. Uh, we don't want like a you know the problem of the Middle Ages where only the elite class spoke the language of the Bible and everyone else was just left to trust the pastor. Please, we've got the Bible. Read it. It's good. But what I'm trying to say is we miss stuff because there's stuff hidden in the Greek. In the Greek, it states that she gave her bios, literally her life. She gave her all. It's not about money, church. It's about the demands of being alive. This woman gave up and gave her very life to God. She gave everything. That's clear in the Greek. She gave until she had nothing left and then gave more. Now realize, church, when we apply this, this is not necessarily about money. Just think about this. Life, its very self, demands that you give more than you can. I wonder if you've thought about that. The very act of being alive is a demand to reach out and be beyond yourself. To give of yourself until it's done. I mean, this is from when you're tiny. This is the joy about having kids. I love watching my son because he was like me. He just wants to do stuff before he's actually figured out how to do it. So he couldn't walk, but man, did he want to. And every time he fell, and he fell hard, he hit his head a couple of times. He would get so frustrated with himself because it was beyond him. He couldn't do it. I remember the first time he crawled, and he got up, and he's bouncing back and forth, but he couldn't get the first movement. And he just fell down and goes, ah! <laughs> life was demanding more than he could give. And that's life. Life itself demands that you give more than you can, church. Welcome to the universe. It simply does. It always will. You want to be good at anything. If you really want to be good at anything, it's going to demand that you give more than you can. You want to play guitar. You're going to have to push through those sore fingers. You want to play drums. You're going to have to figure out those beats. You want to start being good at your job, you better start applying yourself to the nth degree. Why? Because it demands that of you. Now, if life demands that of you, why do we think God would demand any less of us? In fact, God calls us out of ourselves and literally demands of us our bios, our life. If you cling to this life, Jesus says, you will lose it. But he who gives up his life for my sake will gain it eternally. Jesus is basically saying, you better give up on everything. And I'm going to say this tonight, church. Your Christian faith will take you through extreme demands on yourself. If it's not, you're not doing it. You're playing games. If your Christian life is not taking you through the ringer, You're not actually living it. You're devouring it. You're using it as a tool rather than what it is, which is demand upon you. But here's the beauty of it. God calls you beyond yourself because that's his destiny for you. He's not happy with you being you. Now that sounds terrible. You're great. But you know what God wants of you? He wants you to be a little Jesus. He wants you to be perfect. And I hate to break this to you. I hope this is not a, a news flash to you. If it is, we just need to chat afterwards. You're not perfect. Right? We're not. And so what is God going to do to you? He's going to demand more than you can give. Why? Because only then, when you come to the end of yourself, will you discover what God wants of you. Jim Elliot, the famous martyred missionary, said this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. 
Church, the reality of the gospel is that we are receivers of grace. We could not earn this. What we have tonight is centered on Jesus. We can do nothing to earn our salvation. It is given. We are given that which we had no hope of ever securing. And what was the cost? Have you ever thought about that? What was the cost of this amazing gift? God incarnated himself in Jesus Christ and gave what? A little bit? A nice gesture so you could get some likes on Instagram? Jesus literally gave his life for you. God incarnated himself in the person of Jesus and gave it all for you. The ultimate giver. And that's what God calls us to reciprocate. To give that which we cannot earn. And here comes the lesson of the text in our church. As long as you are living for yourself, your own improvement, your own happiness, your peace, you cannot give as is demanded by the gospel that has been given to you. Because the gospel in its very nature is outward. There's no focus on us. I mean, God so loved you that He gave, right? But you received what you could not give, what you could not earn. And so your life is to be lived in, res in response to that. In fact, if you do this well, if you commit yourself to this task of loving Jesus and loving others as He loved them, I guarantee you will be forgotten. You will. Your greatest acts will be swallowed up by the endless march of history because they have to. Because this is not about you. Do you know that we're all going to stand in eternity one day? And all of us are going to want to boast in the things we've done. And we're going to look at what Jesus accomplished and just lay our crowns down. And feel pretty ashamed. And so why do it now? Why live your life to boast? Why live your life to be better? Why live your life to be happy? When the call is to be like Jesus. We did not think equality something to be clung to but humbled himself, even unto death. The gospel calls us to stop worrying about ourselves, to stop obsessing about your goodness, to stop obsessing about your life and start living, giving your all for who? For the other. For the ones that cannot pay you back. Why? Because you receive what you could not pay back. Do you see what I meant when I said what Jesus calls to us is impossible? You have no hope of achieving this. I'm going to finish on this story because I love this story. Me and my friend, we, we made a commitment. This is the same friend that uh, in our church we decided to wake up at 4 o'clock every morning for an entire year and pray for an hour every single day for an entire year at the church. We were like... We were the crazy Christians. We, like got, we fell in love with Jesus and we are like, we're going to do everything. And uh, we, at the same time, we had a, a, um, a competition with each other to see who could read through Romans the most times in a month. And uh, I loved it. He went insane. Like, he literally lost his mind. Because the one day, he was packing up chairs after youth the one Sunday night, uh, the one Friday night. And he's packing, he just fell on the floor and he just started weeping. So we're like, okay, something's going wrong. And he says, I can't do it. I'm packing up chairs and I'm trying to be invisible. I'm just trying to do it for Jesus. And I'm thinking to myself, God's going to reward me because I'm doing it invisibly and no one's noticing. I am so bound. I can't do it. It took him a while to figure out that's the point. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? God's going to get you to the point where you're going to go, God, I can't do this. And he's like, you got it. 
That's the point. God, I'm done. I, I have nothing left to give. Exactly. That's exactly where I want you. Because then you'll lean on me. You're not here for you. You're just not. You're here for him who died for you. And I'm going to tell you, church, you have two choices. You can actually become like him, a giver. And it's going to cost you everything. Or you can continue living the life you're trying to, which is taking, devouring. And you know what you're going to become? Ever increasingly a hypocrite. That's the two goals. Die to yourself because Jesus died for you. Or live for yourself and become empty. A taker. A devourer. The, the former is the destiny we want to go for. We want to follow that not because we want to be anything, but we want to just love the one who gave it all for us. Let's pray. Jesus, we confess to you tonight that every... Well, I confess for myself, but I confess for those sitting here tonight, Lord, we are, we are devourers. We take us. We know it. You know it. And how many times even this week, Lord, have we just lived for ourselves and then blamed you when things go wrong? And so, Lord, we come before you this evening and we humble ourselves and say to the God who gave it all for us, who, who did not withhold his own son but gave that whoever might believe will have eternal life. We say to you tonight, we, we surrender all. We give it up. Our lives, our goals, our hopes, our dreams, our destinies, everything. And Lord, at the end of the day, it's actually nothing in comparison to what we gain in you. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen.